Mark chapter 13. All right, we've been covering the last few days, really, of Jesus' life. It'll take us a little while to get to the cross, but the story is much closer than, than we probably are, although we are coming into that season here pretty quickly. In fact, we'll have our, our uh, Passover uh, night on March 28th. It's not on Passover, I realize that. We'll be a week or two ahead of it, but um, I, I enjoy it much more if we do it ahead of time rather than after. It just kind of seems to lose a little bit of steam with it if you're not leading up to it. And uh, But anyways, we'll go through that. We'll spend a night, not the whole night, but you know, like it's about three hours of teaching time and a meal together and going through with the things that, that the Jewish folks do uh, during Passover. So Jesus is leading up to that in all of this that we're covering right now. Uh, and so, the, you know, the timing of where we're at and what's coming up here is, is pretty amazing, actually. Jesus has moved from the temple. He's not going to go back into the temple from here. He's been in the temple. He's been questioned. He's been examined. He's asked some questions himself. Um, but that time is, is done. The next day or so that he's here he's going to be with his disciples they'll be asking him questions which is really what provoked chapter 13 and, and the next few weeks that we'll be covering um, but it's interesting because Jesus leaves the temple and he goes out to the Mount of Olives and it's the same thing that happens in the days of Ezekiel in the vision that he's given when he's taken back by the Holy Spirit to the temple, the idolatry and the things that are going on in the temple are pointed out to him, and he sees the glory of God leave the temple and move out to the mountain east of the city before it just departs. And Jesus is kind of walking through this again. Here you have had God himself in the temple for the last couple of days in the temple courtyards, teaching and preaching and answering questions and ministering to the people for one last time. And when he's not really accepted, he moves out. And he goes to the same place that, this, that the glory of God went to as it left the temple uh, in the vision that was given to Ezekiel. He makes a prediction in the first couple of verses, and we've already covered that, but just as a... a, a uh, a refresher he goes out and they ask him you know do you see these stones how and, and really kind of what they're asking is how big these massive these are some of these stones were absolutely huge uh, 700 tons big it was an amazing display this building the temple in the courtyards 35 acres on the temple mount beautiful the roof of gold, but with spikes so that birds couldn't land on it. The outside with white marble, so bright on a sunny day it hurt your eyes to look at it. Would have, if it had not been destroyed in 70 AD, probably would have been considered one of the seven wonders of the world uh, when, that first, when that list first came out. But Jesus says this is all going to be thrown down. Not one building, not one stone will be left on another. This is all going to be torn down. And we know, obviously, it was fulfilled to the letter in 70 AD by Titus Vespasian. When Rome finally overthrows Jerusalem, comes in, the temple is set on fire accidentally, but it melts all the gold, it runs down into the stones, and then the stones then, by his order, are taken apart so they can get the gold out from between the stones. And thereby the, the uh, prediction or the prophecy of Jesus himself here is fulfilled 100%. That not one stone would be even left upon another. If that is true, and it is, we know it's true. If his prophecy is so specific and fulfilled so specifically, then as we look through these other things, I want you to keep in mind, this is not allegorical. There may be some things that are symbolic in this as we go through this, because this is going to take us into Daniel. It already has. Into Daniel, into Revelation, some of the other books. 
But when Jesus speaks and he speaks of a prophecy and it literally is fulfilled, we can take it for granted, I believe, that the prophecies that are left that he speaks in the rest of this chapter are going to be literally fulfilled the same way. That one day these things will, by the letter, by the word that he spoke, come to pass. Now, the, the four that are with him, or maybe four just move in closer, and Peter and James and John and Andrew, they ask him to tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign uh, when all these things will be fulfilled. So they want to know basically when's the end of the age. Because this has to be, because they're looking at Jesus as the Messiah. He's got to be setting up a kingdom, and in their mind maybe they're thinking, not only am I going to clean house, I'm going to destroy this and build a new house. And so they want to know what is the sign of the end. When is this going to happen? This, can't, this has got to be the time of a new kingdom. Now we know that the destruction of the temple does not signify the return of Jesus and the, uh, the new kingdom being set up. In fact, what it resulted in is the dispersion, the Jews being dispersed throughout the world. So another prophecy could come to pass that says that they would return to the land. And it's happening. It's been happening all of my lifetime, literally. They move back into the land. It becomes Israel again in 48. They take Jerusalem as their capital in, what, 67. And then... Our president moves our embassy and declares Jerusalem, backs them, this is their capital, just a little, two years ago. These things are undeniable. The first thing Jesus says, and we went through this, we're going to move kind of quick because we got to verse 9 last week. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. And the implication here is you're to, to constantly take heed. You're to constantly look after the things that you are being told. Not just mark a, a, a checklist off, but you're to, you're to constantly make sure that those that you're listening to, the people who are teaching you, are telling you the truth. That what they say matches up to the scripture. You should never just take my word for it. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, Paul says that the Bereans were of more noble character than most because they searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what he was telling them was true. And again, if they're searching the scriptures daily in their time, they're looking at the Old Testament to make sure that what this New Testament apostle is telling them is true. So the idea that today we can disregard the Old Testament is ridiculous. This is God's word beginning to end. And unless it gives some kind of a picture or, or suggests that something that is being said is, is an analogy or a symbol, we need to take it literally too. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he. And will deceive many. So many are going to come saying they're the Messiah. And when they do that, they're going to deceive many. And, we, and we've had many people claim to be Jesus reincarnated or Jesus come again. There are some, I think I heard this week, there have been, since Jesus, 36 people, Jewish people, people who have claimed to be the Messiah since then, till, till now. <laughs> and there's one now in Jerusalem. Some rabbi has, is telling people that he has direct connection to him. He's, I don't know, hiding out in a, in a building somewhere and hasn't revealed himself, but this rabbi is talking directly to him. And Jesus said, those people are going to deceive many. Everybody's going to know when Jesus comes back. There'll be no doubt left in the minds of those who are here that, that Jesus 
is here. When we get to the end of all of this, at the end of the tribulation time, when he comes back to set up his kingdom, all the lights go out, man. The sun gives up its light. The stars don't shine anymore. It's only him. He reveals himself and everybody on the face of this planet will know he's here. There won't be any he's hiding out in a building. He's over in a desert. He names specific places. If they say I'm out here in the desert place, don't go. If somebody tells you he's over here, don't, don't go. You know, we had a guy in New York. He's not coming back to New York. He's very specific to where he's coming back to. You should read Revelation. You should read Daniel. You should dig into all of this and, and find it and see it and search it out and try to understand it as best you can. And people are so afraid of this. We read a, a, a five or six verses last week where the Bible says to take comfort in these words. In the teaching of the second coming of Christ, take comfort in it. 300 verses in the New Testament alone that, that point to his return. We, we need to study this. We need to know about it. You know, and people say, well, nobody knows the day or the hour. Yep, I got that. I know. I, I don't know. So it could be 50 years from now. It could be 1,000 years from now. Yeah, maybe. But you know what I do know is what some of the signs are that he's coming. Because I've read about them. I want to know when the season is. I want to know when it's close. Because, man, if you just look at this world and think it's going to get better, it's not showing any signs of that right now. And we can skip some of these other things that we're going to talk about or that we talked about last week and just look at the condition of men and how we treat each other. This can't go on. It can't continue the way it is. It's not going to recover. They're not going to get better. In fact, the Bible says that it's going to grow worse and worse. And if that, you know, sticks a finger in somebody's eye who wants to have a positive outlook on life, I want you to have a positive outlook on life, but I want your 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 focus to be on Jesus. That's the only way to have a truthful, positive outlook on life. Because it takes your hope out of this world and puts it into eternity with him. And you won't look then at his return and all the, the build up to it and all that's going to happen with it. You won't look at that as something that's... I mean, it's negative, but at the same time, and it's horrific... But it comforts us because we know that it's not much longer before he comes back. He says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do not be troubled for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. So because we hear of a war breaking out or we hear of threats of, of World War III starting or whatever, it, that doesn't mean the end is, is coming with that. I mean, I, I, I probably should have. I have done this before when we went through this kind of thing with Matthew. I think I, I looked up how many different wars were going on at this one time in the world. It's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy how many wars are going on right now. And that doesn't count the threats of wars. All the saber rattling that goes on. Wars and rumors of wars. That, that's going to happen. But it's not the end. Four, nations will rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. And you guys, when you start breaking that down, and again, see, you know, I've been doing this for, what, 10 years with you guys as your senior pastor. I've been doing this for another eight and a half years in Kalamazoo. And before that, and walking with the Lord since I was a kid, and I'm still learning. Because when you take these nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, it literally starts talking about people groups or ethnic groups fighting with one another. There's not just governments that are fighting and butting heads, but it's turmoil within ethnic groups.
and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. And we know. And I, I pointed out some things um, last week. In a, it's amazing how many people have died in earthquakes and what, you know, the tsunamis and such that result in the earthquakes in the last 10 years. It, it's, it's amazing. And the wars and the rumors of wars. You, you guys realize that 82 million people died in World War II? 82 million people. Soldiers and civilians, and 29 million were wounded. And we haven't learned our lesson. You know, everything changed with the dropping of an atomic bomb. Well, two. So then the mentality changed and the warfare changed. One of our big submarines, the Titan class submarine, just one, has 40 times more power than all of the ammunition detonated to include those two atomic bombs. 40 times more power in one sub. So multiply that by the number of subs we have, by the number of subs that Russia has. One sub can hold 200 nations in check. Or hold 200 cities in check. One sub by itself. That's, that's amazing. Things have ramped up. Things are happening with more intensity and more frequency. That's something to pay attention to. It talks about these things being like birth pains. And if you've had a child, or you've been the man sitting next to the bed when the child's being born, you know how this happens, and we talked about this again last week. They start off slow, and they grow. And, and pretty soon they're running into each other, the contractions that a woman has before the child is born. And they get more intense and they get more frequent leading up to the birth of the child. And that's a, 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 a way that Jesus and that, um, the apostles in, in their writings, that's a way that they choose to, to show us or to describe to us how this is going to be. It will grow with frequency and intensity. And if you look at it, it's, you know that that's true. You see things happening all over the place, and it seems like everybody's tense, everybody's wound up, everybody's ready to go to war, and then all of a sudden it just kind of backs off. And then it comes up again, and it starts to grow, and it gets more tense, and more things are happening, and we're thinking, man, is this it? And then it just kind of dies back off and everybody relaxes for a little while. These are the beginning of sorrows. He says, this is the, the travail. That's what that's talking about. So verse 9, it says, but watch out for yourselves. Listen, in this chapter alone, Jesus tells us to take heed in verse 5, in verse 23, in verse 33. Do not be troubled in verse 7. Endured, verse 13. Pray in verse 18 and 33. And to watch in verse 9, 33, 35, and 37. In other words, guys, pay attention. Again, people will take the verses that talk about Jesus coming as a thief in the night. He himself says that. The apostles who write the epistles say that. But he still wants us to pay attention. In Matthew, when he talks about these things, he says, when you see these things happening, look up. So you have to pay attention to see them happen. And then when, it, when you see them happening, look up. Because why? Your redemption is near. We should be paying attention. The apostles lived like Jesus could come back at any time. John and Paul both warned, the day, the time is short. Even at hand. 
And you say, well, yeah, well, that was 2,000 years ago, and he's still not here. Well, Peter would tell us that in God's time, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Now, that doesn't necessarily give us a way to measure the timing of God. That's just saying God is outside of time, and it's not a big deal to him. A thousand years isn't that long to him. It's like a day. It's all the same to him. It's why he's been able to say through the prophet Isaiah, and I quote this a lot, See that I have told you the end from the beginning. So that when it happens, you will know that I'm God. I've told you ahead of time. So you're not caught by surprise. Paul would tell us that we are not children of the night. That we should be caught by surprise by this. But we're children of the light. We should be able to see it coming. And if you've never read the book of Revelation to be able to know what's going on because you're afraid or don't think you can understand, John writes in chapter 1, verse 3, man, blessed is he who reads this to understand and keep all of these, all of these prophecies. It, it's hard to understand. It takes a lot of study. It takes a lot of digging. I understand that. I understand that. But it draws you closer to the Lord. It should inspire some urgency to spread the gospel now before he comes. To be about our father's business when he does come. So that when he comes, he sees us conducting ourselves in the ways that we should that honor him. So verse 9 again, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony to them. So watch out for yourselves. Be ready because this is going to happen. And we see in the book of Acts, this happened right away. Jesus ascends into heaven. And then sometime after that, the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, the church is born. They pour out into the street, and they begin to preach. 3,000 come to, come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on the first day. And it's not long before they're all arrested. The 12 are arrested and taken and beaten and told not to preach in his name anymore. And it says they went out joy, full of joy because they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. The religious leaders, the synagogues, that's what it's talking about. The councils and the religious leaders, or the synagogues, they're going to take you, they're going to beat you, they're going to throw you out. For Jewish believers, for Jews, that, that's their identity, right? They go to synagogue. It's why when you go through the book of Acts, you see Paul will go in and he'll enter into the synagogues and he'll teach in the synagogues. But you're going to be put out of the synagogues, Jesus says. You, whatever you think is your identity is going to change because your identity is in Christ and not in who you are or what you brought, were brought up in. Now your identity is different. It's new. You've been given his name. In the book of Revelation, the letter to one of the churches, it tells us we're going to get a new name. So the religious leaders won't like us. They won't like you. They'll, be, they'll take you out. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony to them. And we see that in the book of Acts too. Paul is taken in front of Felix and Festus and Agrippa. And we know eventually before Nero who ends up killing Paul. Paul saw the whole gamut of that. Paul was one of the ones who arrested people and beat them and threw his vote to put them to death in the beginning until Jesus got a hold of him. 
And then he faced it. And he went through it. And when it says for a testimony to them, does not mean that it's going to change them. That they're going to become believers because we stand in front of them and give testimony. And in fact, I think it was, I can't remember now if it was Agrippa or Felix. I think it was Agrippa that said to Paul, you almost persuade me. But then dug in his heels and as far as we know was never persuaded. Billy Graham said that every world leader he ever had the opportunity to meet with asked him, what does the Bible say about our time? What does it say about the end? Are we there? Are we getting close? People who don't believe, ask the man who believes. I've had it asked of me. When 9-11 hit, the first person I talked to, I worked for the phone company then. I was out by myself doing my jobs, and then I got bits and pieces of it throughout the day from some customers, but even most of the customers weren't very talkative about it. Everybody was watching everything on TV, so I was kind of out of touch. I knew a little bit about what was going on by the reports on the radio, but when I pulled into the garage, the first thing that happened was a woman that I had been witnessing to came to me because she was there getting ready to go home, coming off duty. She came right to me. Is this it? Is this what you've been talking about? But to my knowledge, never gave her heart to the Lord. They'll ask you. When people find out you're a believer, they'll ask you, is this it? It's like they're trying to wait to the very last moment that they possibly can to submit to Jesus. And, and is this it? They're going to ask you, is this it? If you can say yes... This was it. This is definitively it. I can see Jesus coming now. I can hear the trumpet. I can, I can hear him calling me out. You know. But there's still some hope for them, even if they don't go in the rapture, because we know there'll be believers in the tribulation time. But man, a believer in the tribulation time? talk about life on the line when it reaches the point when the Antichrist can't touch the Jews anymore he turns on the believers and he's given the ability to kill them we see in heaven in, in Revelation more than we can count the martyrs who will be sitting at the altar saying Lord how much longer how much longer is it going to be before you take revenge on or for us There'll be more martyrs then. It's going to be so much harder. If you can't. In fact, if you look at Revelation thir uh, 15, I believe. 15 or 16. As the bowls are being poured out. The judgments are being poured out on the earth. People are in pain. They're being scorched. And they blaspheme God. And refuse to repent. Which tells you they know. Many of them know where it's coming from. And there's one of them that brings darkness and pain. And because of that. They blaspheme the God of heaven. And refuse to repent. And, and I'm telling you. You already see the foreshadowing of this coming. You already see people that are in that mindset now. All of these things that we've already talked about, the, the natural disasters, the persecution, all of that, in that seven-year time period just grows even more. A third of the world's population dies. That's all of North America and South America and Europe. To reach a third of the year's population right now. And it could be even more than that. Man, if the Lord doesn't come back by 2025, they say by 2025 we have 14 billion people on the face of the planet. A 
third of that. Joe Foch was, as an example, uh, said that when the avion flu hit, I think in the 1800s in Philadelphia, people were dying so fast they couldn't, the morgues couldn't keep up. People were piled up behind the morgues. What, what's going to happen when these things grow? When there's more death on the face of the planet than, than we know what to do with. And listen, that doesn't count the animals. When the waters turn to blood, all the creatures of the sea die. I mean, you all going, man, this is not good news. No, there is good news. You can avoid it all. Know Jesus now. Give your heart to him now. Don't wait. Because there's a day coming when we hear the trumpet blow, man. When we hear our names called. When like in, in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, when God says to John, come up here. And then from then on in Revelation, you don't see the church anywhere else but in heaven until we come back with Jesus at the end. That's where you want to be. That's why Paul could write to the Thessalonian church and say, listen, comfort each other with these words. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It's hard now. It's going to be hard. But man, one day the dead in Christ are going to rise and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him and meet him in the air. And never ever to be away from him ever again. But you're going to be amazed if you're following Jesus in this time, in this age of grace, when the whole world, whether they know it or not, is under the grace of God, because he could just say, done. That's it. But right now, everybody, because the church is still here, everybody is technically under the grace of God, because it's still offered for them. They're rejecting it, but it's still there. The church is here. One of these days, next week or the week after, we'll get to the Antichrist. And we'll spend some time on him and who he's going to be. Not by name, but all the details that we can find in the Bible of him. <clears throat> And it says he won't be revealed until that which restrains is taken up. When the Holy Spirit working through the church is finally taken out of the way, things just get that much worse. It's hard to believe when you look around at the things that are going on in the world today that we are restraining evil. That the church is a restraining force. But we are. The Holy Spirit is really the restraining force, but Him working through us is what is restraining and holding back evil from being what it can actually be. Verse 10 says, The gospel must first be preached to all nations. And when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak but whatever is given to you or whatever is given you in that hour speak that for it is not you who speak but the Holy Spirit so if you're delivered up you're brought up in front of somebody a judge, a ruler, a politician whoever and you don't have your Bible don't worry about it don't lay awake at night and think man if I could look at the president face to face right now this is what I would tell him Don't worry about it. Man, you just keep studying. You keep taking in God's word. You go closer to the Lord. You do what he wants you to do today. And if that opportunity presents itself to speak to somebody who has some standing, somebody who has some authority, one, it's unfortunately not very likely that you're going to convert them. But hey, try. Because it's what we're supposed to do. Pray for them. And if they'll let you pray for them right then. 
Pray for them to have wisdom. Pray for them to, to, you know, here I am. I'm doing exactly what God or Jesus just told us not to do, right? Premeditate. I'm premeditating for you. The gospel first must be preached to all nations. So remember the original questions. When is the end of the age? When is this all going to happen? And we heard from Joe a couple weeks ago, man. You, we've got a whole section over there. In the, I always get the numbers wrong. Is it 1040 window? Where uh, the majority of the world that lives in there has never heard the gospel at all, doesn't know anything about Jesus? So he says it's going to have to be preached to all nations. But there's going to be a day when that is completely fulfilled. And it'll be during the tribulation time. It'll literally be an angel that flies through the atmosphere preaching the gospel. Three angels with three points to that message. Now see, there's a part of me that wants to see that. But I know at that time, I won't care because I'm going to be in heaven. I'll be with Jesus and I'm not leaving there to see that. If I need to see an angel, there'll be plenty of them around me then. I don't have to <laughs> worry about that. But there'll be three that are going to completely fulfill that. Before the end, before Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, before he comes back to Armageddon, it'll be completely fulfilled. So does that mean we abandon the 1040 window and go? don't go? No, we should go. Anybody who wants to go should go. Anybody who's put on their heart to go should go. But I'm telling you now, it's been put on us with instruction at the very least and you should take it to heart and you should you should uh, embrace the mission that you've been given to just go into the world that you, you're a part of now. I gave example a couple weeks ago of, the, of the, the number of people in our community where there are many churches who have never heard a single word of the Bible. in the Christian nation. They have no idea what one nation under God even means or what God they're even talking about. So don't think that to fulfill this, you need to go to a, another nation, another country, get way out in a stick somewhere to, to villages that have never been touched. <laughs> a lot of your neighbors have never been touched. So just be about your father's business. Man, if God sends you, then go. You'll be scared to death, but go anyways. And it doesn't matter what nation he sends you to. Go. But until he says, hey man, buy a plane ticket and go, just get outside the house. At your school, at your, on the job, the grocery store, wherever. Be ready to share the love of Jesus. Be kind. The Bible tells us it's his kindness that brings us to repentance. Be kind. The rest of the world is not. You be kind. And preach the gospel. Know how to share the gospel with somebody. Verse 11 says, but when they arrest you, and the implication there is it's going to happen when they arrest you and deliver you up, and do not worry beforehand. All right, we talked about that. So don't worry about it. But not, what this is not, let's talk about what this section right here is not. It is not an excuse for a teacher of the word of God of any kind to not study. This is not an excuse for Christians to not study the word of God. This is when you're caught by surprise with an, with a, uh, an opportunity that you weren't looking for. Don't think you have to have your Bible with all of its notes sitting in front of you with all the little tabs in there so you know where you're going next. To be able to witness to somebody. 
That's what it's saying. It is not saying, don't worry about studying. Spend less time in the Bible. And listen, there's pastors out there who tell you to do that. Very well-known pastors that will tell you, oh, we need less Bible study. We don't. We need to study the Word of God. Now listen, some, some have more opportunity than others. Some have more free time to be able to be in this than others. But I'm going to tell you right now, we all need to set aside time. You say, man, I'm too busy to, to study the Bible. You need to cut something out. I need to cut something out. If I'm too busy, I need to cut something out. There it is up here. But this is what it says to us. This is our instruction. 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul tells Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know how to do that? That means study, man. You'll tell us in another place. You let scripture interpret scripture. You don't have to have a whole library full of commentaries from the 1800s to now to understand the word. John told us, you know, we don't have to have another teacher. We have the Holy Spirit within us to help us, to guide us through his word. You have the anointing. Remember, we just went through Hebrews before we, before we hit Mark. And the writer of Hebrews said, some of you should be teaching. But you're stuck in the milk of the word. You only want the easy stuff, the stuff that's easy to digest, the stuff that makes you feel good. It's all you want. You want to dig into it so that you can teach. You shouldn't be drinking milk anymore. You should be eating the meat. And you've been walking with the Lord long enough that you should be able to teach. We, we've had the opportunity as a church. And, and I love that part of the reason we're so small is because of this opportunity to send out other people to go. Whether it's somebody like Josh to go and be a pastor in another church. Or somebody like Abby and John to just move to another location because that's where their friend group is and they want to reach their unsafe friends. And we've had the opportunity to gather around many people like that in the last 10 years and send them off. Go do what God's telling you to do. And hey, if you get there and you find out this isn't it, this you were wrong, then come home. And we'll send you to when you're ready to go, we'll go. I learned that from Pastor Chuck. He used to tell the guys at his church. That, that was his whole focus. His pastoral staff, he just assumed that one time or another, sooner or later, they were going to go somewhere else and start another Calvary Chapel. Go start another church. He, he was so sure of that, that he, 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 if you were on the pastoral staff then at Costa Mesa, you didn't make enough money to live on. You, you still had to have another job because he wanted them to be ready because he knew when they go to start a church, man, they're going to have to work outside the church as it begins to grow and build. Eventually, they could, they'll, they'll you know, be there. Eventually, you would reach a, a point where the church can pay you. But if it doesn't, man, you gotta you got to be able to do things. you got to be used to doing that. Paul did it. Sometimes Paul had enough, sometimes Paul didn't have enough, and he had to go to work. Sometimes he did it because he just got the inclination that he didn't want the church taking any credit for taking care of him. Yeah, I'm sure it had to do with whoever was there and whoever was in the area and what their attitudes were. And because he was saying, you know, when I was with you, man, I didn't ask anything of you. I didn't take anything from you. This is not, I've kind of gone down a rabbit trail there, but this is not, this is not a, a verse where you can just say, you know what, man, I ain't worried about it. The Holy Spirit will speak to me when I get up there. You know, that's, that, that's not okay. 
that's irresponsible. To just think you can get up in front of people, big or small, and just wing it. And you just fly by the seat of your pants. You don't study. You don't prepare. You don't pray over it. You, you just, oh, the Holy Spirit will do it. Now, I'll, I'll confess to you, there are some Sundays when I have to depend on the Holy Spirit more than others. I, mean, I have to depend on the Holy Spirit every Sunday. So I have this mindset every Sunday. But sometimes I get up here and I don't feel very prepared. This is, I'll give you one example of, of somebody this is talking about. There's a group of us ministering to a group. I'm not going to get too specific. But a group of us ministering to another group. And I just said, hey, we had a little group message going on so we could communicate with each other through the week. And I just, hey, I, I think I, I have the message for this week. And the other guy who normally was the one that was teaching was like, oh, no, I got the message for this week. I, I believe I got a word. I'm like, all right, cool. Just back off. I'm like, how hard can this be? We should all be able to do this. This is a good Friday. This is not a big deal, right? How, how much easier does it get for a Bible teacher to teach about good Friday? So we show up. And we have the worship time. And the guy gets up there. He says, man, on Tuesday I had a message and then God changed it on Wednesday. I'm going, oh, no, here we go. And he changed it again on Thursday. I'm like, changed it four times. And you know what? While we're standing back here worshiping, he changed it again. I'm like, I can't, I shouldn't even say the words that I thought. I was so, I'm like, you'd be kidding me. And one of the other guys from our little group message looks over at me because he, he didn't interject or intervene. None of us did, actually. I just was like, you know, I just let it go. I didn't say anything else. I didn't say okay. I didn't, nothing. I just let it go. Because in my, in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, it's Good Friday. I'm, I'm focused on Good Friday. I'm focused on what's going to happen. I'm focused on our Passover dinner. I'm focused on Sunday morning. So we're doing this thing on Good Friday. Of course, I believe I have a message for anybody on Good Friday. He, he, him too, right? And nothing to do with the cross. Not one word about it. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Dude, man, you just got the softest pitch lobbed up to you. How do you not hit a home run out of that? With a group of people that you're not even sure know anything about it. Well, what I believe was happening there was the Lord was just getting me ready because I, I had the end of the service, the prayer time, and I had more time than I usually had. So, you know what? The Good Friday message came out anyhow. And I watched him sit there and put his head down as he's listening to me. I'm like, I don't have to say anything. God can deal with him because he knows what he did. He wanted the status. He wanted to be in front. And he wasn't really concerned about those people. And that's too bad. It's not an excuse for that. We're to, we're to prepare. You're to be ready. As much as you're to be ready about the end, as much as you should be ready for Jesus' return, for him to call us out, as much as you should be ready for that, you should know the scriptures about that so that you can be encouraged every day. Because if our hope wasn't in him, what, what hope would you have? You should be ready every day. How it comes out. I think is what this is talking about. How it comes out is how it's going to come out. Listen, Jesus, or I'm sorry, Peter on the day of Pentecost came out 
and with, you know, 119 of his friends filled with the Holy Spirit speaking to people, something they hadn't really done much of anyways, if at all. And I believe it at that time and, and at another, another time, the Bible says Peter being filled with the Spirit began to speak. And you say, well, see, it worked for Peter. <laughs> Peter spent three and a half years with Jesus. You don't get any more intense seminary than that. When the, the, ins, the, inspira, the inspirer for the scripture is sitting in front of you, telling you and expounding on it, and this is what it means, and this is how they've messed it up, but this is what it means. Peter knew. In that culture, man, they go to synagogue school from the time they're little. They've been taught. He had been taught the scriptures. If they hadn't, his brother Andrew wouldn't come to him and say, Hey, we found the Messiah. Come on. They wouldn't have known what they were looking for. Again, it's why the Shema is so important, right? Hero of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he goes on to say, You teach your kids. From the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you teach. You teach. Teach your family. There's so many teachable moments in our in our in our day. In, in I can't tell you how many we miss in a day. And I'm preaching to me, not just you guys. This is this is me too. Think about a day. How many teachable moments do you miss? Now, my my problem is with my kids. I like to try to rewind it and go back, and they're like, hey, "I don't even know what you're talking about, Dad." What? You? I'm like, no, remember when you said this and I said that and I missed it. I should have said this and I should. I want to go back and fix what I missed. And I, I usually end up probably making it more confusing for them. Just be, you know, repent and talk more. Pay, pay better attention. Study. Let them see that this is important to you. Set the example. It, Jesus wasn't just important for my salvation. He's important for my life, my living this life. And again, you guys, we, we take this, this book for granted in our country so much. We have brothers and sisters around the world who don't have one or only have a portion of one. You, know, you can go online and see videos of them being given their first Bible, grown adults, their first Bible ever in their life, and they're holding on to it, and they're crying, and they're weeping, they're holding it up to their face because they've longed for it. And here's what you need to know is that Bible had to be smuggled to that person. And there's a possibility that it could have been taken from that person not long after that. We take this for granted. We live in a place God has given us the ability to meet together openly, to all of us have one of these in our laps or on our phones, to be able to have them on our computer and have somebody else read them to us. And yet, sometimes we act like we're starving. Or it's just not what I want to eat today. You know, I, I am probably a guilty parent of having my kids come and say, oh, man, that's what we're having for dinner. Well, go fix yourself a sandwich or go do this. Eat what you want to eat. Then. If you don't want this, this is what we're having. But, you know, man, when I was a kid, it was, yeah, you'll eat this or you go to bed hungry. You didn't have the luxury of go eat something else. It was just, here it is. This is in front of us. This is, this is, man. If you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, you know. You've walked past your Bible sitting on a table and, and felt guilt. Because it's sitting there. 
and you're passing it by because you've got to go do something else that you're committed to. And it's almost like it's calling you, pick me up. I've been sitting here all day. Maybe I've been sitting here all week. And it's the Lord saying, I've been sitting here all day. Not that he ever leaves you, but I, I just sit with me for a little bit. Talk to me. It's knowing this and knowing him and having a real relationship with him that's going to allow you or make it possible for you to go through some very hard things. Verse 12 says, Now brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child, and the children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. I wish I could say that this was only going to be true in the tribulation time, when things are super hot and, and fired up and parents have taken the mark of the beast and the child is refusing, so they turn him in, or vice versa, as it would say, brothers are going to betray brothers to death. I wish it was only then. But we know there's other places in the world, man. You're a born-again believer. Your family will turn you in. You have crossed the line if you believe in Jesus Christ. More people have died for the faith in the last hundred years than all the other years before that put together. From the day of Pentecost on. You say a hundred thousand right now, a hundred thousand people a year die for their faith in Jesus. It's between eighty and a hundred thousand a year people are, are losing their life because they believe in Jesus. So you can't even say this is gonna happen in the end. But it's multiplying. It's happening more to a greater degree now than ever before. You'll be hated for you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. I mean that's pretty self evident. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That doesn't mean that you have to endure to the end to be saved. It means if you're saved, you'll endure to the end. If you're saved, you'll endure to the end. You read how some of these people have died. Just the 12. John's life of a martyr was to live a long life, which was not, not done by anybody in his time. But... You know, the average age of a man was like 45 or 50 years old back then. John lived into his 90s. John saw all of his friends die. A martyr's death, horrible death, shot full of arrows, beheaded, and a number of other things I don't even want to talk about right now. It's horrific. Look up Fox's Book of Martyrs. It tells you. And down through the centuries. People who have given over to the Lord and, and are put to death because of it. So there's no promise of, of health and wealth and everything's fun and everything's happy and everything's... That, that's never promised to a believer. You don't get a, a writer of the church saying, hey, endure like a good soldier. Any of us that have ever been in the military know. And there are days when you have to endure, when it feels like you're enduring. Those are not good days. Those are not the happy days. It doesn't mean you're not full of joy. It just means you aren't necessarily happy. Two different things.
we're going to get into the great tribulation coming up. But today, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because we're going to take communion. All this that we're studying, this teaching time, this time in the temple, when we get to his arrest and his crucifixion, it's all leading up to that. And this cup and this little piece of matzah that, that Jesus takes and breaks, this is all part of the Passover feast. There's four main cups in the Passover feast. There's one called the cup of redemption. This is the one he takes and hands to his disciples. And the words that he speaks are of a groom to his bride. And the, the matzah, I believe, that he takes there is part of the afikoman, the part that they take and they break and they go and hide and have the kids find it and bring it back. There's a lot more detail to that, but we're not going to get into all that. It's important here, though, that we understand what Jesus is saying. He says, take and eat my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you have a Bible that has red letters, you'll notice those are in red letters. Those are words spoken by Jesus to Paul. At some time after his conversion and between his ministry starting, Jesus appeared again to Paul and gave him some instruction according to this. And so he had the same instructions that the disciples had on that last Passover day when Jesus sat in front of them. This is a new covenant. is my body, the sacrifice. They would know fully what he was talking about because Passover was all about a sacrifice. As they were getting ready to leave Egypt and the last of those ten plagues came, the death of the firstborn, to escape that death, they had to participate in that Passover. They had to eat a lamb and they had to... They had to Prepare it in a certain way, in a certain fashion. And that blood of that lamb had to be on the doorpost of their, of their home. So it had to be on the top, it had to be on the two posts on the side. But likely, if they threw it, on the doorpost, it would have formed a cross on their door. Now they didn't understand when they had that last meal with him. They didn't understand that even in a couple hours from then that he would be arrested. They didn't fully understand everything that he said to them then. It wasn't until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came that they really fully understood what they were taught. So maybe whether you're watching or you're here, you're thinking, I, I don't know all the details of this. I don't understand everything about this. But you have the Holy Spirit. If you are a born-again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you to give you understanding of this. And when we get closer to the cross, we'll, we'll dig more into it. He says, as often as you do this, remember me. Those were words that were spoken to a, a, at the uh, engagement of a young man to a young woman. When he would take a cup of wine and hand it to her. And her, her symbolizing or her letting everybody know that she accepted marriage proposal was to take that cup and drink it. When you read in the Gospels this account, Jesus says, take this and drink all of it. The words that he speaks have to do with the wedding of, the, of the, the bride and the groom. The church being the bride. Jesus himself being the bridegroom. 
He spoke often in terms of marriage. We miss it because we don't know the culture. But when you begin to see the culture that was around in all of it, you didn't hear the words and you understand those guys knew exactly what Jesus, or they should have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because they knew the culture. They lived it. So we're going to have, we're going to have the worship team come. Let's do the last song. All right, yours is up here already. While they're doing the last song, let's have everybody come up, grab a cup, grab a little piece of matzah. We'll do this together this week. Let's kind of hang on to it, pray. Man, if you, if you need to get something right with the Lord, get it right with the Lord. I'm not one of those guys that say, oh, hey, you know, if you think you've been living kind of compromised or you've not been right, then just avoid this. Don't do it today. Get it right and do it next time. No, man, get it right now. Pray now and take this. It's called communion. You're communing with God. Do it now. Listen, if you're not a born-again believer, then this isn't for you. This doesn't get you saved. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You need to ask him to save you. Now, if you do that and come up and take, awesome. Then it's for you. But this isn't some magic deal that gets you saved. Jesus wants a relationship with you, not a ritual. This is a remembrance. You say, as often as you do this, think about me. Now, the first church being Jewish, probably the only time they did this was at Passover every year. They didn't do it every month like we do. At least, that's what I think. I mean, this was part of the Passover meal. Now, later, as the Gentiles began to, to come into the church and it was open to them and they received the Holy Spirit, maybe it happened more. I don't know. Maybe this is just a Western thing and this is what we do. We want to remember him often, so we do it often. Whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter. As often as you do this, think about him. Think about what he did for you on the cross. The lengths he went to to save you, to offer you his grace. And it's not just about nails. It's not just about thorns. It's not just about a spear in the side. It's not about suffocating on the cross. It's about those three hours of darkness when he took on the wrath of God. And when he came out of that, he said, it is finished, paid in full. This is the literal translation of that. Father, as we get ready to Take, Lord, I pray that if, if somebody's watching and wants to do this with us, that, that that's awesome. Uh, if you've moved somebody to do that, that's awesome. Or whether we're here, Lord, we always have things that we need to put before you. Lord, if, if you've been convicting us of anything, all of us, myself included, if there's anything in our life that we've been convicted of and have been resistant to your work in that, Lord, I pray that today and this moment would be the, the day and moment of surrender. you are always refining us you are always sanctifying us you are always active in our life but most of all Lord I pray that as we do this there will be this longing to see you just well up inside of us and not just to see you Lord but to tell others of your love and grace and mercy and what you did for us on the cross so that they too will join us with you In Jesus' name, amen.